it's basically doing one of these depth first searches and sending the information back in pieces. So that the only thing I actually store in my machine is the length of one path at any time. And then I back up and I go down another path. And I back up and I go down another path. The time I'm taking is horrible. It's this whole huge exponential tree. But the space I'm using at any time is just the length from the root down to the bottom. And that's polynomial time. That's n time. So I can do this problem. I can figure it out in polynomial space. But I can't figure it out in non-deterministic polynomial time. And all the p-space complete problems are just like this. They're all alternating games. I'll give you an alternating game on three satisfiability. This game is p-space complete. I give you a formula. And instead of me asking, you know, is there some way to make the formula true? Is there some assignment, true or false? Instead of that, now we play a game, me against Doug. We got, here are the variables, x, y, z, w, u, v. And down here is a big formula, big long formula. And now I'm not asking, is there a way to make true and false values there to make this formula true? I'm asking to play this game. Doug gets to pick the true-false value for x. I get to pick the one for y. He picks one for z. I pick one for w. He picks one for u. I pick one for v. We go back and forth picking true-false values. My goal is to make this thing true. His goal is to make the thing false. Who wins? Does there end up being a true value for this formula, or does it end up being a false value? Assuming we play the best possible game, who wins this game? So that's called quantified Boolean formula, or QBF. It's just like 3-set, except you alternate choosing the value of the true-false values for the variables so that you can't just go ahead and pick a collection and check whether it works. You have to alternate your quantifier so that every other one is a for all, and you lose the non-deterministic advantage. 3-set is like this game where everything's uh, there exists, there exists, there exists, there exists. There's some value, there's some value, there's some value. You pick the true-false value, you get it all for free. There exists is like non-determinism. For all, kills non-determinism. Non-determinism is great with ors. It's terrible with ands. You can't use it at all to do ands. And now we have to do it with ands. I pick it, that's an or. Doug picks it, that's an and. For every way, whether he goes true or false, I got to win. So this problem is harder than 3-sat. As far as anybody knows, it sits up here. The same way satisfiability was the first NP complete problem, quantified Boolean formula is the first p-space complete problem. All right, so this is giving you a sense of what time complexity and complexity theory is kind of all about. I want to just quit with one little thing to give you a sense of something that I worked on, I don't know, maybe it's six or seven years ago already. But it's the same geography game. Because this geography game was proved by it might have been proved by, by Mike Sipser to be p-space complete. But there's a variation in this geography game that I once gave as a programming assignment to some freshman. And then I thought about it and thought about it and wondered whether it was easy or hard. And then it ended up being two or three years later writing a paper on it. <laughs> well, they could program it. They just couldn't program it efficiently. Um, here's the game. You play geography again. You have the same book. You give everybody a book. You play the game. But this time. Instead of having to take your move from where the other person left off, like, uh, like you start. Uh, Cleveland. Cleveland. So I don't have to start with D. I can start with anything I want. I'll start with uh, North Dakota. And now Chris has to continue. And he only has to continue with what he left off last time. And I continue with what I left off last time. So it's like, uh, it's like playing with yourself geography. You, you just sit in the same room, but every person just keeps going you know, with their own list. It's nowhere near as much fun. <laughs> right? And what's your gut instinct about this game? Doesn't it seem like it might be easier? Right? I mean, <laughs> yeah, it's playing with yourself geography. <laughs> I see. <laughs> it seems like it might be easier. Because you don't have to worry about what the other person is going to do. They don't seem to be interfering with you as much. But you, you, do they, they use taking, it up? They they, right, right. You can't use Cleveland. I can't use Cleveland again. Right. So they really do interfere with you just in a more subtle way. You know what this is like? What reminded me of this. 
after I thought of it, and then I had the students program it. It reminds me of this game that you see in this old Disney movie called Tron, or a video game called Tron, where you have these two people riding these virtual motorcycles, moving around, and they try to cut each other off so somebody crashes first, because there's no more room left. So imagine this game played in a graph. You have the same directed graph, but now you have two tokens, two places. And every turn, somebody moves one spot. I go here. Chris doesn't continue from here. He continues from here. And I go here, and he goes here. And I go here, and he goes here. It's just like Tron. And we try to cut each other off. And the first person who crashes into himself and gets into a dead end loses. It's exactly like Tron, except Tron is real time, and it's really a game of reflexes and not a game of you could slow it down slow enough so that the person could think a long time on his next move where the best way to go. But it's, it's Tron slowed down a lot. And I thought that this would be an easier game. Or at least there'd be some way to come up with some reasonable strategy. But it turns out this game is piece-based complete also. And the only kind of graphs that you can play this game on that actually have any chance of being understood at all, if you play it on a directed tree, no cycles in the graph. Like the book represents just a tree of, of names. Then you can figure out who wins. But if, but if it's any more complicated than that, even if the graph has no cycles in it, so it's a directed acyclic graph, I mean, there are underlying cycles but no directed cycles, it's still hard. So this is one hard problem, even though it seems like it wouldn't be. So that's what we're going to be talking about for the next few days, complexity theory. Relationships between complexity classes, relationships between space and time, Newfangled notions of how to measure complexity, one called an alternating machine that mixes the ands and ors together, and then relationships between them and both results that are practical and results that theorists think are beautiful. Interesting, weird ways of measuring complexity, which turn out when you give it log n space to be the same as p space. It's nice to see these things collapsing on themselves and equaling each other because it makes you feel like your definitions are more robust. So the prettier the theorems, the more robust the definitions, and vice versa. So that's what we'll be talking about from now till the end. There's a lot of things to talk about in these topics, including computations that model probability, interactive proof systems, alternation, uh, all sorts of things. We will visit diagonalization again, because inside P, there's going to be a hierarchy. There are things that can be done in n squared that can't be done in n. Things that can be done in n cubed that can't be done in n squared. So we're going to move up and down, and try to understand these relationships as, as best as we can next few days. Okay.